Hello, and welcome to DIY Access. I'm your host, Kat Chetty, and today we're going to be talking to a very good friend of mine, Jenny Abeda. Uh, we went to school together at NMSU, and we shared the experience of quitting a program. And our conversation today is going to center around quitting as a form of access. So we're going to go ahead and start with Jenny introducing herself. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, so I'm Jenny Abeda, and I am the resident property designer at TheaterWorks. Okay. And how did you get into that job position? I know that uh, that happened after you left the program. So let's start by talking about that job and how you've been doing since leaving. Yeah. So that job, I, I used to intern there back when I was in high school and I had kind of been in and out of it a little bit. And then after quitting the program, I just kind of went back and went back to the director and said, Hey, I've got nothing else going on right now. <laughs> so is, is there work here? And, um, geez, I think that it's been four years. Let's, let's start with like talking about school a little bit. So we were both in the same program at New Mexico state university. Um, I don't really remember how long were you in the program before I showed up? Cause I got there August, 2017. How long were you? I was there one semester before you got in. Okay. And then I guess I wanted to ask, um, I don't think we ever talked about it. Did you have like a whole bunch of hard time in the program before we even met or did the really rocky stuff start, um, with some of the incidents that we saw? Uh, I started seeing like glimmers of what both of us would be seeing the semester after. I definitely think it got worse after that, but I don't think it was like, uh, it had anything to do with the new people that were coming in. I think it was just, um, I, th I think there was stuff that was happening in the first semester that was like the, the red flags that we were going to see tenfold the next semester. Okay, and then we'll we'll get around to that because that's uh, kind of predicting one of my later questions, which is like, how do you know when things are going wrong? Um, do you do you remember like a singular moment early on, looking back, that you could say, okay, maybe that was like the first sign that this was not a good place to be. I, I remember instances. I don't remember the first one. Um, the things that really stand out to me were like the first review session with our group. So as you know, we had our, our class where all the grads get together. Everyone has studio visits. And it was kind of in that first studio visit that you're learning, okay, this is how these work. This is what these are going to feel like in the future. Oh, and talking about the reviews, right? At the end of the semester, talking studio visits and, and, oh. and reviews, both of those things, um, because the studio visits were one thing and it was maybe less daunting than the review. So obviously the review is like, we have every faculty member there. We have every grad student there and it feels like an execution. <laughs> um, I still talk about this with some of my peers in the program I'm in now, and half the time I think they don't believe me because of how horrific it just sounds coming out of my mouth when I'm describing like the process yeah. that we went through. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it definitely has something to do with the environment. And I've talked about this a lot when I'm just talking about classes. And if you're teaching a class, you have control over that environment and whether that's a place where people feel safe to open their mouth and where they feel safe to get something wrong when they open their mouth. And there are some classes where you don't open your mouth and there's some classes where you do, but it's kind of up to the people who are in charge of that situation to create that environment. And I could feel right away in our program 
this was not an environment where it is safe to fail. Yeah, yeah. Or make a mistake or say something wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, I was actually... Or, or try new things or, <laughs> yeah. or try something that maybe it's everyone's telling you, hey, that's been done before. And you're like, cool, but I haven't done it. So I would like to try. <laughs> Well, I mean, even just technical stuff, like I remember being told over and over and over again, whenever I had ideas about um, using electronics or doing anything with coding, that that was a literal impossibility and there was no way I was going to acquire the skills necessary. Same, same thing. I definitely heard um, when I was, when I was getting into certain things that it's like, you shouldn't. You don't have time. You you got to be making, making, and making, and you don't have time to pick up new skills. Where are you going to learn coding? <laughs> I did it in a semester. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it would have taken me a semester, man. <laughs> Still really rocky and have a lot to learn, but um, like having somebody to lead you through at least part of it gives you the confidence you need to go, okay, maybe I actually can do this, and this might be an important part of my practice. Or not, but it's there's something there in like getting to explore it. Like half of the things that I make don't make it out as finished products of my studio anymore, but it's actually a far more productive thing than the kind of making we were doing before. It's like all these failures lead me to far better finished artwork than if I was just making a whole bunch of finished stuff. Yeah. I think they they talked a lot about how much you should be experimenting, but the sheer amount that they expected by the end, you didn't have time nope. for experimenting. You didn't have time for getting something wrong. And usually our process in terms of studio visits ended up tearing away so much of that work that was in its like little tiny stages. Um, where it hadn't grown into the full idea yet, but it would get torn down while it was still a little seed. And by the end, you didn't have as much work as you could have. Yeah, that's true. I wanted to ask you about, like, we'll probably go back and forth here and there as we're talking, um, but would you, do you think that you would have left sooner? Um, and was anything like keeping you from making that leap of quitting the program? Uh, and can you talk about what some of those things might have been? I think the main thing that's keeping you from leaving, as much as you're looking around and saying, this isn't right, this isn't right, this isn't right, is that, well, but other people are here and other people are going through this program and they're you know there's there's teachers there's there there's other grad students and they all see this so it must just be the way that i'm interpreting it there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong um and just kind of that being in the water of it and getting to the point where you're the boiled frog yeah just (laughs) yeah and you just you're like oh uh, okay okay you're do okay you saw that okay you didn't do okay i get that this is okay um, and it's not, <laughs> and it's not, and it took, it took that semester, um, that we had met for me to kind of, it was like the final straw. What do you think, what do you think that final thing was that like pushed you to say, okay, screw this. I can't do this anymore. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know if there was like it was it was it was so many things because as i've mentioned before and as you know i came into the program with my bachelor's in psychology not in art and it was it was interesting because having that perspective where i had spent the first four years of my of my college life focusing on mental health And then wanting to come into an art program where I could talk about mental health through some kind of, where I wanted my art to speak of it. Then I saw things 
<laughs> I saw how unhealthy everything there was. And I'm looking around like, I read a lot of articles about this. <laughs> and this feels way more like being in some kind of crazy, like, Zimbardo experiment that it really feels like being part of a, a supportive program. And without naming names, um, like, I remember having conversations with our peers and just these tearful breakdowns of people who are and we were always crying together like we're just <laughs> like people people shouldn't be in each other's studios crying this much yeah. but that's what we did is you'd go and you'd and being an empath and you walk in and you feel that pain and you're like this person doesn't feel like they can open their mouth this person doesn't feel like they can share their their experience through their art because of how badly it's torn apart that this person doesn't feel like they can make any mistake well and i was going to say is beyond that too is it wasn't just um it wasn't just this whole the word is safety it wasn't just that they didn't feel safe emotionally there they weren't safe there physically. And that was the biggest indication to me that it was time to go. Yeah. Um, this is one thing kind of dealing with some shitty people who are being shitty to you and being like, okay, I can't, but, but it got to the point where you have a program that's saying, if you don't have a mental breakdown, you're doing it wrong. Make your things crazier. Hey, if you're talking about, mental illness i need to look at your work and know that you are mentally ill and that led to some of the stuff and not naming names again we see people vomiting on canvases we see people snorting substances for videos we see rooms in our spaces being trashed and trashed either by um the means of trying to create art or trash just because of sheer frustration when things don't go right yep um and you see people who are being told that they need to drink or they need to be on drugs or they need to be under some kind of influence in order to create the best thing and I monitored the shop. <laughs> I monitored the welders. And I was like, this, this is something I'm hearing from teachers too. This is something I'm, it's not just grad students who are saying these things to each other. This is kind of coming down from teachers, or at least if it's not just teachers saying, yes, do it they're letting it happen and they're looking at the art and they're looking at it and they don't see a problem or they're praising it or appraising like this artwork that somebody is saying that they've made with shaking hands or um has only slapped together with the briefest thread of sanity is <laughs> still intact and yay congratulations that looks great like let's not address the fact that these students are dying yeah it it's still just it it blows my mind i know the the program we were in was especially toxic but i mean i've been thinking about this a lot leading up to this interview with you and when i think back even on my undergrad at the university of texas at el paso like there were aspects of that that were, you know, strikingly similar to what we're talking about. I think I've told you about how we used to um, cry in the music practice rooms because they were soundproof, like after critiques. Mm -hmm. And that's that was part of the culture of that undergrad program. And what I do to kind of like center myself nowadays whenever I'm having trouble is reminding myself that, you know, how privileged I am to be able to go to school you know, have most of the cost of that taken care of and 
just the idea of going to school for art also is so privileged. And to think about mm -hmm. that attached to any kind of systemic trauma is, is just insane to me. It shouldn't be that hard. No school should be that hard. Um, yeah. And I feel like that, that was actually something that you hear a lot too while you're in the program is like, well, I had it hard. So you and it's, it, it's <laughs> that cycle. It's that this is generational. This is, this is a pattern of abuse because it, I, I feel like when people talk about, oh, you're in an art program, you make, you, you know, you make art that, um, you know, you're not, you're not writing some kind of incredible hundred page dissertation and um, it's not using that same kind of part of the brain. So I feel like how the art programs make up for it or tries, tries to make up for this lack of, you know, well, academic, you know, hardcore is by making it so hard in other ways. And I think how they've achieved that is, it's not the way. No. <laughs> it's not the way it should be hard. It should be like intellectually challenging and rigorous, but you shouldn't be like checking yourself into the psych ward, you know, <laughs> semester because you're having a hard time handling everything. It's too much. <laughs> Um, I was also thinking about, I wanted to ask you if you've had this experience, but I was thinking back to every job I've ever had since I was 16. And I can very clearly remember every position I ever quit. I was told by a supervisor, whoever was in charge of me, that um, I would never get another job because they weren't going to give me letters of recommendation. And this is the best it was ever going to be. And I've noticed that that's the exact same pattern that was repeated at that program we were in. And I just feel like it's this part of the larger work culture of this country. And I don't know if that's held true for you or not. Yeah, I, I know there's, there, there were definitely a lot of things kind of in place that were, trying to keep you from going. Um, even kind of this whole mentality of like, well, if you're, if you're quitting, it's because you're not smart enough, thick skinned enough. You're not, uh, there, there's something about you. And it's, it's a part of the, the culture we have of victim blaming where a bully can get away with being a bully by making the victim feel like the failure was on them and then they can just keep on being bullies because you've made a culture where well you're getting abused because of x and y or you feel like you're being abused because of x and y and you just need tougher skin you know you just need to grow a spine you just need to stand up for yourself um and that makes it so much harder to quit. <laughs> well, especially in like, I, I mean, this is true for a job or in a school program. Um, even for somebody like me, that's an old, older student, like that power differential between the teacher who is in charge of your grade and basically has control of your entire future, you know, um, has power over you and you are at some level aware of that intimidated by that and i think that people that are in power positions need to be more aware of that power differential and how it affects the people under them you know oh we've 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 definitely talked about that a lot <laughs> and I, I can remember specific examples and not naming names but it's like if you're if you're saying that a student should do this and you, you know, if you point a finger at that teacher, they, they get the chance to say, well, I didn't, I didn't tell them to do that. I'm sorry. You're in a point of, of power. That wasn't a suggestion. <laughs> it, I, it, it's just not. I had a moment in the classroom teaching this semester where I, I, I pulled back immediately. I heard the words come out of my mouth and it was just like a suggestion for um, how to draw something. But I said, you should do this. And the minute I heard it, 
you know, come out of my mouth, I was like, oh God, that sounds so like aggressive and um, commanding. And, and I immediately dialed it back and said, I don't mean should. I mean, this is something you could do with your drawing. And I think mm-hmm. that's important is to be aware of how just like one word choice can change the character of an entire sentence. Yeah. And I, I remember having that kind of problem, even when we started first trying to report some of the issues that we were seeing. And there was a teacher at one of our reviews who is committing to me, who took the same training uh, to be able to teach that she did, what is a clear FERPA violation and is calling out students, you were called out on this, yep. for, for absences. And the thing is, I remember submitting basically a complaint into the department uh, that would handle those things about that saying, hey, I think there was a very serious verbal violation because these students were forced to disclose um, where they had been for, for this absence because she was pissed that they'd missed class. Uh, one class, by the way, but just I remember. Missed, <laughs> missed class. And I got a response because a university has to cover its own ass that was like, oh, well, based on this and this, those students weren't required to to disclose that information. Yeah, but we um, sure felt like we had to, you know, stand oh, in front of like 30 something odd people and, you know. For sure, <laughs> because you had every single person's eyes in the department on you. Um, what else are you gonna do? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's those horror moments where like, you know, when you're past it, you look back and you're like, oh, I should have just gotten up and walked away or I should have done this. And yeah. you're frozen in that moment. And I think oh, that's, yeah. that's another thing that people in power simply don't seem to understand is that you, first of all, you need time to think about what just happened you know, you can't mm-hmm. formulate a response on the spot that's going to be the best response. And you can't, like, they just expect you to be on all the time. Like, oh, if you really thought that this was like a microaggression or whatever or a vi- violation of your rights, then you should have been able to, like, pop that off right then and there and tell me, like, oh, this is a first No. And, y- <laughs> and you, re- you remember of the times that we've had to engage with faculty members and things like this. Um, it was, like, the next day after we'd slept on it. <laughs> I mean, and then... <laughs> And then we're in each other's studios like, was that as, is that, has it been keeping you awake? It's been keeping me awake. Like, oh, <laughs> should yeah, we do the waiting? I forgot uh, about the waiting until you said like that nerve wracking, anxiety provoking extension of the event, you know, where for days you would just be sick thinking about what are the actual consequences of this going to be today, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. So that brings me to the one, the question we alluded to earlier, which is how, how does someone, so we know when we knew it was time to quit. Um, if we're talking about quitting as this form of access, like how do you know that it's time to leave a toxic situation? How do you know an environment is toxic versus uh, you're just being a little lazy and people are just kind of being, you know, assholes like (laughs) i that the no it is a hard one um and it's it's really a trust your gut thing and maybe that's a little bit harder for some people it was definitely hard for me um because i had never quit anything same i can i can tell you like coming in it's like Oh, look at this, this straight A honors student went to the honors college at ASU and did her thesis and um, did all these things that were terrifying at the time and pushed and and did everything. And then all of a sudden, 
I'm in a program that I'm still getting all A's. I'm still technically getting okay scores on reviews. I'm still, uh, but, but there's something really wrong. But you felt awful. Like you feel it. <laughs> yeah. It's it like, I, we had someone leave, uh, the program last semester here at this school that I'm at and um they came to ask me because I I was the only person they knew that had like left an MFA program and asked a whole bunch of questions about like how do you know when it's time to leave and I kind of fell back on the gut thing too um and one of the things I told them was if if you're walking in the building and you're nauseated like if, mm -hmm. if you are so emotionally uh, pulled out that your body is starting to rebel because you're not listening to your mind. You, you really do feel it in your body. And it's yeah. that safety thing. When you walk in and you don't feel safe and you don't feel like it's safe to speak, you don't feel like it's safe to show people things and you don't feel safe physically in a building, it's time to go. I mean... It's nuts to think about it for me now, but I was having seizures. I was so, I was so depressed and so stressed out and so overworked and so abused that like my body was rebelling. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. And I, I remember I, I, I still to this day keep a, a series of notes in on my phone on things that had happened that I had written down. Uh, I have a picture of myself on one of the worst days because I remember turning my phone's camera around to see if there was something on my face and I looked like shit. <laughs> and I took a picture, man. I took a picture and I kept it because I refer to that when I need to remind myself because it's so easy to leave and be like, oh, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have. And you're beating yourself up and you need to look at that picture of you yeah. looking like shit. You need to look at your phone, at your notes, at what's happened. You need to remember that day that you were like, I'm gonna just walk into the parking lot and get hit by a car. Like, I, <laughs> this is how I'm feeling today. It's... I still have to bug Josh all the time because, you know, I, I went through, I've been doing therapy and I realized that like some of what was going on was me, but the things that they were doing to me were still absolutely atrocious. And the only thing that could have improved was maybe my reaction to those things. But I think I still, I, I still would have left. I still, I think left. absolutely. And the, I, I see the biggest difference between us being um, how much we fought. And I feel like that's why you were there longer <laughs> is because you fought and you would fight and maybe see a slight thing like a like a tiny little reward like a little treat and then and then everything would hit shit again yeah and go revert like being in an we've talked about this too being in an abusive relationship where you're like he said he's gonna change <laughs> he said he'll change for me and <laughs> he said it would never and, happen again <laughs> and, and 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 so you know, you kept fighting it and I didn't. And I think part of that is we're different people. Like I, I can't fight. I'm so squishy, man. I, <laughs> I, I like if somebody even, if I even started trying to describe to somebody like, Hey, you, you did this. I would be a mess. No one would hear me. My words wouldn't even come out. Um, <laughs> so we left very differently as well. I thought I could win. I mean, when, <laughs> you, when you think you're doing the right thing, you know, and that you're like fighting the good fight, you have this delusion that like, 
it's like the movie lies that they feed you your whole childhood. Oh, yeah. It's, it's so Hollywood. If I just stand up to the bully and I <laughs> tell them to their face, then they're going to get haunted by enough ghosts that at some point they'll change and you wish for it and you want it. But you're not going to change something that is so venomous in that system. It's so part of the way that it was built. And I think this is like, uh, this is the thing I really wanted to hit on with this conversation is like, it's not, it's quitting is so not a part of our cultural vocabulary at all. It's not, no. it's, it's not okay. You know, nobody wants to see themselves as a quitter. Um, and I think it's, you want to moralize the situation and you want to say like, Everyone at this institution is bad. It's a bad institution, but that's not necessarily true. And this is part of what I talked about with the student that was asking me for advice is it, this, this particular place and this particular time might not be the right place and time for you. And that's okay. And that's, it doesn't have to be that you're like the hero in some epic moral fight against the bad institution. It could just be like, this is the wrong fit for me. And I think that needs to be normalized too. Like it's perfectly acceptable to go somewhere, start something like a job or a program and realize like, holy crap, this is not what I thought it was. And instead of like barreling through and finishing anyway, it should be okay for you to go, this isn't what I wanted. I'm going to go do what I wanted. Yeah. And I, I think that like you were saying how it, it's something that's so fed into our american culture of never quit but that's the reason we end up hurting ourselves by staying with that abusive boyfriend yeah <laughs> being in an abusive program uh, not giving up <laughs> yes all these things that there's a reason that someone with more power is feeding you that kind of shtick. It's because it benefits them and it doesn't benefit you. Yep. I think that was, that was a great way to round out the end of that. Um, so how have you been doing since you left? So much better. <laughs> <laughs> like like a hundred percent like what's i don't know more than that i three hundred percent three hundred five hundred it's it's really easy to say like yes i'm doing better but like what what's better i mean obviously you left the toxic environment like yeah. obviously there's a lot of emotional and no i know clean up that needs to happen there, there's a lot of stuff that's going to stay with me forever. You know, it's like, well, that damage is done, but, you know, just, you know. <laughs> there's a scar. That's cool. Just keep that, wear it. And you just, you just wear it and you keep going. But like, it, it really has been such a crazy difference getting back into the theater. Um, Cause I had been away from it for a little while and then, when I came back, I'm like, eh, you guys have anything? I need something to do. And um, the director remembered me and trusted me with like two productions, like here, here are a couple shows we need, we need property design for. And then by the end of the first show, they were like, here's the rest of the season. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and it was just amazing because like all of that, you know, like I'm not working hard enough. I'm not doing enough and all these little things that are going on in my head and everything on the outside world is like, oh my God, how did you make that? Jesus, uh, everything is done already. What? <laughs> and, and how did you do this under budget? <laughs> and just this, like I'm getting all this positive reinforcement that's just bouncing off of my head because I'm not accepting any of it. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just moving through this space. Like, oh gosh, everybody hates me. Everybody hates all the things I do. And it takes, it took a long time 
for anything to penetrate. And I remember there was this one instance for it was the, maybe the second show I was working on when I got back that I made a snow globe. We were doing Elf. And so he needed his snow globe with New York skyline in it. And I couldn't find a nice one or a cheap one. And we're a community theater. There's no budget. And um, so I went to the dollar store and got one of those just dollar store snow globes. And I 3D printed the New York skyline and kind of tore apart some already made images in, um, in Tinkercad and kind of designed the little piece that I want, painted it, threw it in there, got my own snow. And I brought it to the director for that show and our stage manager. And they were just like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? That's just a dollar snow globe. <laughs> And the the kid who's playing the elf, he comes up and sees it and he holds it in his hands and he's like, this makes it real for me. <laughs> That's awesome. And I was just like about to cry. Like I made something that made these people really happy. And that's kind of the superpower I have. And I didn't know that it was because nobody treated it that way. Yep. <laughs> and I've never left <laughs> that environment because it, and it's not just that like oh they're they're yes men they tell me everything I like to hear like I I get so challenged in so many other ways in this job every single show requires a different skill set like oh well in this one we need a bunch of cakes that look realistic or in this one we need um a crap ton of puppets that are made out of wireframes or whatever and i i was the sculptor who had just done everything and all of a sudden i'm in a place that needs that <laughs> it's like uh you never know what you're gonna get and what skills you're gonna have to learn and pick up or do um to make all these crazy objects and magic tricks and just the, yeah, way, I'm... Just the way you're talking about your work is like so vastly different and i think we'd had a conversation <laughs> about that before where like i'm happy now making things and i didn't realize how completely miserable i was <laughs> <laughs> dude i i, I I hate doing this, but I want to do this. And it's like, I remember, you know who I'm talking about, who somebody mentioned like art being fun. And the response was, oh, <laughs> who's having fun here? <laughs> I had, I had one of those moments too, um, where I was uh, yelled at for saying that I had fun with the photo shoot god forbid that we have fun oh while making artwork <laughs> <laughs> or the thing that we love to do enough to study it do people do that to scientists like they're yes. just sitting are they sitting happily on their computer like crunching their numbers from their experiment and somebody comes up like why are you having fun you shouldn't enjoy you're statistics. doing statistical analysis <laughs> Oh man, no, it, it doesn't feel like work anymore. Uh, I think I, I commented to Josh about that, where I think I spent like eight hours beating one of the wearables I was making and my hands hurt and I was sore and I didn't care. I could have kept going because I was like so happy because I'm, I'm essentially able to do what I want with my work now. And there's a certain amount of trust I'm, I'm given that I wasn't given before. And mm -hmm. it took me forever to be able to appreciate that and run with it. Like, I think you were talking about that a little bit, like, you know, you're out of the toxic environment, you know, you're in a safe space or a safer space and you're still like inside in your mind, like, 
cringy. Yeah, and I, 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 I still get that, but it's not as bad anymore. But it's definitely one of those things I'm going to be carrying on is reminding myself that whatever that voice in my head is that's beating me up is not it's not the truth. like that no it's not the truth and it's like a remnant of of something that's past because it took a long time to enjoy making things again and i remember i was making things for the theater for a really long time before i ever started making stuff for myself again oh yeah you were talking about that um yeah it took a long time because i would feel like i would pick something up and i'd be like oh i want to make these earring they're kitschy they're cliche they're it's just you know more stupid crap and you just you just hear all that stuff again and and you you almost feel guilty (laughs) you're like i'm crocheting something but (laughs) it's so stupid because you're just like this is this is an art this is an art because you just hear that and and it takes a long time to not feel guilty um just making something for yourself again i'm figuring out as i'm getting older part of dealing with systems like in any institution any system is going to inherently have some of these problems because you're taking human beings which are like extremely multifaceted complex things and forcing them into this like really rigid um system this manner of doing things and not everybody is going to fit inside that set of rules and i think that's that happens with that'll happen with even the best program is you're going to see people that kind of fall by the wayside because it is a system yeah and and that's the weirdest thing is having an art program yeah that is (laughs) <laughs> is that that lives within that system it's bound to be it's inherently filled with flaws yeah because it's structured in a way that doesn't it doesn't match the idea <laughs> yeah yeah um i think that has more to do with like there are very specific reasons i think for getting an mfa i i don't think that you need one to be like a freelance artist necessarily um you of course need it to teach uh, maybe to get some positions in certain kinds of creative production but i i think i see a lot of people in these programs who have been fed the idea that they have to do this to become a real artist Mm-hmm. And I don't know yeah. how helpful that is to those people specifically. Some people need it and thrive within the structure, but a lot of people don't. No, you don't. You don't need any degree to be successful as an artist exhibiting in places. You just kind of need to know the way to apply for for programs, for grants, for shows, and things like that. Yep. You don't need a degree to be an artist very true we're speaking blasphemy on the show right now (laughs) (laughs) but no that was amazing thank you for all of your dredging up some of that um trauma even in vague terms (laughs) even in i will not be naming these people terms no and that wasn't the point of today either was not to try and um attack the reputation of anyone but to talk about this idea of quitting what do you think could be done to kind of start dismantling this like larger cultural resistance to quitting because we're seeing it right now with um what are they calling it the quiet quitting that's happening you know across the country um i think yeah people leaving a lot of jobs and things like that for sure yeah so um i think that's uh, that's been moving things in a good direction because the thing about it is that there's always going to be that overarching power in place that is saying no you can't quit on me you'll never quit on me and that's the bully that's the bully that's talking so for for people who are in a position that they need to 
quit a job or a relationship or a program or whatever, whatever it is, you're not going to change that structure magically by yourself. The best thing you can do is protect yourself. And the way that I quit was me trying to protect myself. I, I didn't go out, you know, flame throwing the entire building and walking out the doors (laughs) as much as I wanted to, (laughs) but it was definitely me writing a lot of emails and, uh, cushioning a lot of people's egos and saying things like, it's not you, it's me. (laughs) (laughs) And I do that for self-protection and also because I am a liar (laughs) compulsively, but, (laughs) but it's, it's, it's it's self-protection and you're, you're kind of quietly putting your foot down and saying, fuck, no, I'm not dealing with this. But on the surface, you're saying, to whom it may concern. <laughs> See, I, I was not that polite. <laughs> I, I did talk to you a lot. And I think that's something that people might find helpful. So if you are in a situation where you're trying to figure out maybe if the environment you're in is toxic or not, um, you're not sure about whether you should leave or not, uh, try to first find people that also left that environment. Those are going to be probably your best resource. And if you can't find people that left that specific environment, you could talk to people that have quit other toxic environments. Because uh, like you said, a lot of the traits are the same um, and are reminiscent of, you know, romantic abusive relationships. So the patterns tend to repeat. Absolutely. Um, Trying to think what else might help. I mean, if you can't leave the situation, because I know there's some some situations. Definitely, yeah. um, Try to band together with other people at your uh, job or your program, because if you are suffering, um, I can guarantee that there are other people that are suffering as well. And it just might be a part of that culture to keep you from communicating with one another. And I think it's the same way that it is in relationships that it is with these programs where there's a certain sense of isolation where the people who are all boiled need to stick together and be boiled. And the really important thing is finding support outside of that network. You, you need other people to rely on. And it even helped me having friends and, um, and, and just, colleagues who are in other departments even on the university where it's like is your program like this i mean maybe a little bit but is this like this and just you you need a support system you need people who can catch you and help you who are not tied into that network that's abusing you also to remember that a world exists outside of anything that you're talking about whether it's a job or a school program um it will feel like that is your whole world and you need things to remind you that there is a world outside of that system. Yeah, that was definitely hard because you don't see, you you just see like, well, I'm quitting and I'm not going to have these letters of rec and I'm not going to have all these people that I'm leaving the program with. But as soon as like I got out those doors and found some people from Arizona that I used to work with and got kind of involved back into some old, um, some old jobs. It was like, oh my God, why didn't I do this sooner? Uh, yeah. <laughs> there. <laughs> Hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so much better. Yes. It just be be. Do the kindest thing you can do for yourself and don't stay. Even if it feels like there is nothing to fall on, you can go and find something to fall on. 
Yep. And there, there are plenty of other people out there. You're in good company. <laughs> the, <laughs> so. Well, thank you, Jenny. That was an amazing conversation. Thank you for your time today. Um, thank you. Um, would you like to tell us about any of the stuff you're currently working on? So if people are curious, they can kind of check that out. Uh, yeah. So, uh, like I said, I'm the resident property designer at theater works and we always have amazing shows going on all the time. I would know (laughs) (laughs) I'm always there. So, um, we have, um, Five Lesbians Eating a Quiche coming up. We've got Hunchback of Notre Dame coming up. And not the, not the, it's Disney Hunchback of Notre Dame, but it's like the sad Victor Hugo ending. So it's got all the amazing music, but it's got the sad ending. That somehow seems better to me. I wish I could. It it is. It's so, it's going to, no, it's going to be really dark. It's going to be really amazing. If you send me links, I can share those with everybody. Okie doke. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much again to Jenny for being willing to have a conversation with me about what is a very sensitive subject still for both of us on a very public platform. Um, I think it's very important to kind of reduce the stigma around things like this uh, by kind of shedding light on some of the hidden processes, even if that does relate very directly to our specific experiences. I think that pretty much sums up my ideas at this point. Um, This is something we might circle back to in different forms. I have a few guests coming up who will probably be touching on ideas of quitting and functioning within systems that may be toxic or uh, non-productive. So I will be introducing our next guest. I met them through social media on Instagram and ran across her work and was extremely blown away by the care and consideration of the work, not only as artwork in and of itself, but in relation to another human being. Um, So her name is Tori Christensen, and she is a textile artist who weaves dynamic forms and textures together to produce tactile art meant to be seen and touched. I'm very excited to have a conversation with her. It will probably be our first time talking, um, but I'm also excited to see how this connects back to some of the ideas that were in the episode where we talked with Rob Duart and Meredith Lynn about the shows that they put on for the visually impaired. Thank you for tuning in, and I welcome you to join us again for our next episode. Uh, Please like and subscribe, and I'll talk to you next time.